Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this month's webinar, where we're going to look at the case study of P&A ferries and what they got wrong when they carried out their large scale dismissals. So before we get going, I'm just going to clarify that from um, for the purpose of the webinar, obviously, we're looking at things from a UK employment law perspective, but just to flag, there are other uh, jurisdictions uh, relevant to seafarers um, so it's uh, a little bit more complex than a straightforward UK employment law but I just wanted to flag I'm going to be coming from the UK employment law point of view and to really see um, whether their uh, approach to handling redundancies was a good example for us or, or, you know, or not if this is the case so let's get going and um, as usual we would like to introduce ourselves so um, some of you will know me. I'm um, Victoria Templeton, one of the HR Knowledge Managers, and I run the monthly webinars. And I'm joined today by Sue Watson, who is our Head of Client Services. So Sue will be supporting in all our poll discussions. And um, with her experience and knowledge, we'll also be able to help take your questions at the end of the webinar. We're also supported today by Rebecca Johnston, our marketing manager, and Rebecca will be on hand in the background to help us deal with any technical issues should any arise, but fingers crossed, um, everything will go uh, smoothly this morning. And because we've got so many of you today that have joined us, um, you've all been placed on mute, but as I said a moment ago, there will be opportunity to um, ask your questions, so we do want to hear those, of course. So when you see this slide, this means that we're at the end of the webinar and we'll be ready to take your live questions. And here's a quick run through of how you can do that. So on the screen now, what you'll see is an image of uh, your GoToWebinar panel. And essentially all you need to do is type in your question in the questions pane and then submit those and then we'll be gathering those throughout the webinar and then we'll um, aim to read as many as we can in the time that we have left at the end. And as you will all know, for those of you that um, are regulars to our webinars, we like to make them as interactive as possible. And so we've got quite a few polls coming through in today's webinar. And so when you see this slide, that just indicates one's coming up. Uh, just to flag as well in terms of when you want to participate in a poll, just make sure you're not in the full screen mode on your um, a computer just because for some reason GoToWebinar doesn't uh, effectively work with the polls when it's in the full screen mode so just make sure you're out of that there. Here's a quick look of what we'll be covering today. So obviously I'm going to start off just explaining what happened on the 17th of March. I'm going to highlight um, just some key points around the legal jurisdictions that I've just sort of mentioned a moment ago, um, but I'm going to be moving on to looking at the issues around redundancy dismissals. Um, I'll also touch on um, a couple of other areas of um, HR, so the minimum wage and uh, GP. And then I'm going to give um, an update from an employment tribunal perspective, um, and then we'll close the webinar with your questions and answers. So without further ado, we're going to start. And I'm going to run um, a poll immediately. So um, Sue, if you could kindly call up the first poll. Yeah, and I'm, thank you. I'm interested to know at this point, would you book with P&O Ferries in the future? So we'll uh, have a few moments to cast your vote. Yeah, I think we need about there now. So let me thank just you. close that poll and what share the numbers. There you go, 88% wow. no. <laughs> no. <laughs> and 88. Now, um, I guess, uh, I mean, uh, it could be for any number of reasons <laughs> why that no is quite high, but I suspect it might be um, on the back of all the publicity and everything that came out back in March um, around uh, their handling uh, and dealing of, uh, you know, their employees. So that's interesting um, that those statistics, aren't they, So very <laughs> and probably and as I say it doesn't come as a surprise <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for that poll and um, what we're going to do now is um, just sort of uh, just talk through quickly what actually happened so it was uh, back on the 17th of March and all 786 employees were required to watch a pre-recorded video 
And in that video, the P&O boss informed them that with immediate effect, they would be dismissed on the grounds of redundancy. Now, if anybody um, is interested, you can actually see this video um, if you go to YouTube. And it is actually really, really interesting in terms of um, not just in terms of the message they're delivering, um, but actually the way in which it's delivered. Um, so do take a look if you're interested in seeing that it is uh, available on YouTube. So this communication was completely out of the blue. Nobody had any prior notice of any of the issues that were then discussed in this video. Now, the, the CEO went on to say that uh, there had been some challenging financial losses over the two previous years, and that meant a new operating model would be in place. There was no mention of proposed. It was literally stating the fact that a new operation model would be in place, and essentially that new operating model would rely on the use of a third party who would provide agency workers. So clearly um, it caused outrage and um, all across uh, you know, the UK, you had um, parliament, MPs, um, lawyers, um, employees, family members, everybody, you name it, came out um, in uproar about uh, the handling of it. Um, and I guess the thing that came out in the days after, because the CEO was questioned at the parliamentary committee, um, actually they knew what they were doing was wrong. Um, he was questioned by the House of Commons Transport Committee, during which he said there is absolutely no doubt that we were required to consult with the unions, but we chose not to do that. Now, to send that message out publicly, I mean, it's shocking, and that probably goes on to show, you know, backs up that high percentage on the poll there a moment ago of 88%, I think it was, that said no, um, because you've got an employer admitting to the members of the public that they knew they were breaking the law um, and, you know, they chose to act in the way that they did. Now, in terms of um, the handling of it, the P&O obviously chose to make settlement payments to all of their 786 employees. Now, those settlement payments amounted to more than £36 million. Um, and it's also estimated that around 40 employees received over £100,000 each. Um, and the lowest payments made were around the 15,000 mark. So a really, really costly exercise. Um, but it, ultimately, they made that conscious decision to act in the way they did. So, um, as I say, if anybody wants to see that pre-recorded video that they rolled out on the 17th of March, it's readily available. Now, in terms of jurisdictions, I mentioned a moment ago that obviously today I'm talking from a UK employment law perspective, but I just wanted to obviously um, uh, just flag the context in which we're sort of discussing it. So, um, there are uh, different jurisdictional requirements. So, first of all, P&O Ferries employees belong to the Jersey-based subsidiary of the company, and not all were UK residents. Obviously, some were. Now, P&O Ferries generally doesn't fall within the remit of the UK employment legislation. Um, it generally falls under the jurisdiction of maritime laws which obviously I'm not going to go into detail from that point of view. However, there are certain circumstances where they are protected by the UK's Employment Rights Act of 1996, and it's specifically section um, 199, um, section 7A through to C. So um, clearly it's a technical case study that we're looking at, given uh, the different jurisdictions, but we do know um, that there is some UK employment legislation that's relevant and actually we do know that there is an employment tribunal case going through the courts um, right now which um, I will touch on later in the webinar. So in terms of the issues, so at top level I just wanted to sort of flag at this point uh, what we know the issues to be um, and really the first issue or the question to consider is around actually were they genuine redundancies that took place? I mean, the P&O Ferries chap said on that video, you're dismissed with immediate effect on the grounds of redundancy. So um, 
that's his explanation for that uh, their dismissals but were they actually genuine and then secondly we need to consider what happened in terms of consultation which i think is an obvious one to everybody on this webinar uh, from what i've gone through already but i will come on to talk about this um, in a little while thirdly there's the aspect of a uh, redundancy pay you know did they meet their obligations for redundancy pay so we'll look through that and how they handled the situation around pay and then finally whether they took the necessary steps to notify uh, the correct authorities so let's look at the redundancy dismissals and uh, before we get into it i'm going to run another poll so sue if you wouldn't mind just um calling up the next poll for us and it's whether you think that the dismissals were genuine redundancy dismissals from the information that I've just set out. So let's just. Yep, nearly there. Just a few more to go. It's just still coming through. <clears throat> I think we're there now, just about. Okay. So close that poll and share you the results. Okay. So 7% of you think there were genuine redundancy dismissals, 69% no, 24% unsure. And I'll come on to explain, you know, the answer to this in the next slide. Um, but um, as I said a moment ago, there is actually an active tribunal claim uh, going through the courts um, and their claim is citing that the redundancy was a sham redundancy so let's look at the um, next slide we got that up brilliant so for, for redundancy, redundancy sorry to be genuine um, there's a legal definition so um, the employer ceases to carry out um, on the business in which the employer was employed or in the place where they were employed um, and then the needs of the business for the employees to carry out the work of a particular kind or in the place where, um, where the employee was employed cease or dis diminish i've tried to sort of summarize it as briefly as i can but it's very wordy <laughs> um, in the legislation but essentially it's about whether you know the work exists or you know or the location um, always diminished so um i mentioned that the current active tribunal claim in is indicating an argument of a sham redundancy and actually given the fact that um we know the work still remains it remains just in the exactly the same form as prior to the 17th of march then actually the work hasn't diminished the place of work hasn't um changed um, and actually all that's happened is that they're using a different type of uh, worker on a different uh, relationship basis so instead of being uh, employing them they're um, using agencies to uh, provide the staff to cover the work so um, it's arguably then the fact that actually they weren't genuine redundancies because the work is still there so and that links into the uh, that tribunal case that um, that we've got going through where they're citing that it was a sham redundancy but what about consultation then um, because this is also another important legal area when it comes to redundancy dismissals and I, I have said a moment ago that it's quite obvious uh, from what we know of what happened on the 17th in that there was no consultation um, and if we think back to what the CEO said when he was questioned by Parliament, he openly admitted that he knew their actions against, were against the law um, and they approached it in the way they did because they actually knew the, the unions wouldn't agree to it. I mean, I, th I mean, it's shocking to hear somebody admit all of that. Um, and so um, there should have been that consultation process. So legally under the Trade Union and, and Labour Relations Consolidation Act of 92, bit of a mouthful, section 188 requires the employer to collectively consult where they propose uh, 20 or more employees to be made redundant. Um, 
consultation process must find ways to avoid or reduce the number of redundancies and decisions on consultation uh, or you know whether uh, redundancy is happening or not must not happen until um, after the consultation period is closed now clearly there was none of this in how PA handled their redundancy dismissals and so all of these requirements weren't fulfilled which means there was a failure to consult which can render a dismissal unfair and consequently um, lead to a penalty of up to 13 weeks pay being awarded on top of all the other basic and compensatory awards that go along with unfair dismissal claims. So we've got another poll and um, so if you could call that up and it's around um, you know, we know PO admit that they were required to collectively consult with all 786 employees, but they chose not to. So when do you think they should have started to consult with their employees? Given the numbers that we're talking about. Are they still coming in? Mm. <laughs> okay, I think we're just about there now. Okay, oh. let's see what these results. There you go. Okay, so what are we looking at? 4% of you say there's no time limit, just as long as it was meaningful. 15% uh, it must have started at least 30 days sorry before 24 percent must have started at least 45 days and 57 percent must have started at least 90 days yeah so in terms of length of consultation there's no maximum time limit for how long the period of consultation should be but there's a minimum so 20 to 99 redundancies then the consultation must start at least 30 days before any dismissal takes effect and then when you're looking at 100 or more redundancy, then the consultation must start at least 45 days before any dismissals take effect. Now, that's in terms of collective consultation. There's When, it, when you're um, talking about under the 20 employees, um, there's still a legal requirement to consult. It just there's no time frame um, assigned to that. It just the legal phase is meaningful consultation. So, um, when you've got under the 20 people then you've got to consult individually just has to be meaningful so however long a period you can evidence that you've meaningfully consulted but in terms of P&O then yes they should have consulted for at least the 45 days before um, uh, but obviously they failed to do so. I think it Thank changed, didn't it, from 90 days. Which is it did, yeah. The confusion is, is it had used to be 90 days um, and they reduced it to 45 Oh, probably three or four years ago, wasn't it now? Um, yeah. Yeah, so that, that's probably why some of you felt it should have been 90 days. <laughs> yeah. Okay, back over to you. Thank you. So if we look at now the redundancy pay um, and whether they did anything wrong, well, actually, technically, the employees received way more than what they will have done if they'd just been given a statutory redundancy pay. So for the purpose of statutory redundancy pay, you get a half week's pay for each full year of service um, when you're under the age of 22 years. You get one and one week's pay when uh, for the four years of service between the ages of 22 and 40, and then one and a half week's pay when uh, for the full year service of 41 plus years of age. Obviously, for those of you that um, are familiar with redundancy calculations, uh, there's an easy ready reckoner available, so you don't have to manually work out all of that. But um, essentially, um, P&O fare is paid way more um, than what the individual would have got uh, statutory. And obviously, a week's pay for the purpose of statutory is capped. Um, 571, um, I believe, off the top of my head. So um, P&O fare took the decision knowing that it would cost them £36 million to compensate employees for ending the employment via a settlement payment. So clearly they thought it was cheaper to manage it this way than to, um, and to dismiss everybody than to continue with employing everybody. So um, they went down the settlement route, as we know, 
cost them around the 36 million pounds um, and employees were given way more than what they would have gone through the statutory so um, another piece around the legislation is that there's a requirement to only pay the statutory redundancy pay when the employee has the two years service with the employer at the date of dismissal now P&O Ferries chose to manage the settlement so that they gave everybody uh, a settlement regardless of the length of service so um, you know so there were some employees that actually got payment when um, they shouldn't need to have done under the statutory but we know obviously why they've done that is obviously to prevent them going to tribunal uh, so in terms of the uh, the financial elements of P&O Ferries they made their financial settlements um, where they used two and a half weeks of uncapped salary for each year of service. So if you remember a moment ago, I talked about the half uh, a week and a one and a half weeks uh, capped salary at 571. They didn't cap the salary and they gave everybody that flat two and a half weeks. They then gave everybody the 13 weeks pay in lieu of notice and they also paid people 13 weeks pay to reflect the fact that they failed to consult. And Sue, if I can ask you again, we've got quite a few polls. So the next one we have coming up is around um, whether you think there was any legal requirement on P&O to notify authorities. that's just about it I'll close that poll Thank and you. show you the results okay so 74% yes and then uh, nine no and unsure 16 okay so um, what we'll do is we'll run in a second poll because okay. it ties in with this first one there you go and the question is which external authority must be informed of planned redundancies I appreciate not all of you on the webinar may have experience of doing redundancies or um, don't do them as you know as reg uh, they're not regular but you know you probably have done them for some time just a couple more minutes yep Here we go. I'll share those results. Brilliant. Thank you. So 14% the Office of National Statistics, HMRC at 47%, the Department of uh, Business Energy Industrial Strategy 14 and then 26 for ACAS. So um, the actual correct response there is the Department of Business Energy Industrial Strategy, bit of a mouthful. Um, however, um, ACAS may be informed because actually employees may contact ACAS to see how they're being made redundant and it might trigger that whole, um, oh, what's the word, um, help me out Sue, <laughs> the whole conciliation process. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, and so they might be, but it's not the official way of notification. Um, Office of National Statistics, yes, they do report on levels of redundancy in the UK each month, but obviously that will come from the Department of Business NG. And HMRC, obviously they know through the payroll when employers are processing redundancy. But technically, the authority that P&O um, will have been required to notify the Department of Business and Energy. So thank you. Okay. So, under the Trade Union and Labour Relations Consolidation Act um, of 92, there is, as I say, a legal requirement for an employer to notify the Secretary of State, Department of Business, Industrial Strategy, etc., in writing, and it must be 40 days in advance of the first uh, redundancy dismissal when you're dismissing uh, 100 employees or more on the grounds of redundancy. Failure to do so is a criminal offence. Um, and um, there's a set format in which you need to notify the department and that's what's called the HR1 form. So um, 
that literally gets you as the employer specifying the numbers, the type of jobs, uh, the effective dates, um, and you have to submit that um, in writing 45 days in advance of the first dismissal. Now, in terms of P&O, there are some legal questions as to whether the company full, fully adhered to their obligation, and it's a bit, um, a little bit complicated, and um, it links into this jurisdiction piece I, I talked about. So, back in 2018, there's a piece of legislation which you can see it on the screen, I won't read it because it's very long-winded, but effectively that seafarers legislation was amended back in 2018 and the changes meant that the duty to inform the Secretary of State transferred over to notifying the overseas authorities. And so at the moment there's been that legal debate as to whether or not the criminal, criminal offence element of it also transfers over. It's not quite clear or hasn't necessarily been established. Um, that's um, something that uh, wasn't clear when the uh, regulations were amended back in 2018. So whether or not it uh, they'll be criminally liable for that failing to notify the Department of State is unclear. But just to put some context from a P&O perspective. So I'm now going to touch on the minimum wage because that's become an issue as part of the case and um, the national minimum wage applies to those who work offshore sites in the UK territorial, territorial waters or on its continental shelf. So this means it applies to all seafarers on vessels which service UK domestic routes and on UK registered vessels in the UK and non UK waters if they're ordinarily resident in the UK. So what we know from P&O is that um, the company took on the service of agency workers, paying them an hourly rate of £5.15. Now clearly that is well under the national minimum wage. Um, but as it stands, it's something that they can currently legally do. And so what it means, on the back of the whole P&O case, the government have made an announcement to change the legislation so it allows for ports, UK ports, to refuse access to ferries that do not pay their staff the UK national minimum wage. So there has been an, another issue, aside from the approach to dismissals, um, there has been an, a further issue around how they're paying these agency workers. Um, and as I said, the government have um, announced plans for new, new legislation um, for ferries to be refused access if they're not paying them. How that will all work or be administered, I've got no idea, but the government have come out on the obviously on the back of the PO case study, um, being very critical of the organization and um, is looking at ways to make things tighter in terms of employment protection rights for people that work on ferries. And so the next issue as well that's come up as a question mark is around Tupi. So potentially Tupi could have applied when P&O took on the use of agency workers through a third party provider. So Tupi, for those of you who aren't familiar, it's about the transfer of undertakings, protection of employment regulations, and they can apply where there's a change in service provision. So we know that p &O changed their service model by using agency staff to operate the service. And so the, the, there can be an argument that if p and ferries are outsourcing roles to a contractor, their employees should have transferred over instead of being dismissed. So that's something else that's come to light. So if um, there's anybody that's actually looking at a change programme at the moment and looking at third parties and uh, providers just bear in mind around um, whether there is any GP situation that could be uh, happening there. And finally before we get on to QA, and a I just want to touch on the employment tribunal claims. I did say there's one that's been going through. Um, I thought I'd just summarise uh, the um, areas where claims could be uh, can come from. So um, 
we know that a redundancy has to meet the legal definition for it to be one of the fair reasons for dismissal. If not, then it renders the dismissal as unfair. We, all know, we also know that should circumstances constitute a cheapy situation, but cheapy hasn't been accepted and therefore there's not been any fair process carried out and it leads to somebody being dismissed, um, that dismissal would be an automatic unfair dismissal because it's connected to GP. Then we also need to think about wrongful dismissals. So when a dismissal breaches a term that's in the employment contract, such as not providing notice, then that can lead to the claims of wrongful dismissals. And when we think about the consultation again, there is also a separate element where um, when employer fails to provide meaningful uh, consultation or collectively consultation, it can also lead, on top of the unfair dismissal, um, lead to financial penalties under the trade union um, labour relations consolidation act. So there's um, the avenues relevant, obviously, to this PO Ferris case. Now, the case that we know of um, from PO Ferris is Mr. John Lansdowne. Um, so even though he will have had an enhanced payment offered, he's not accepted the settlement and is obviously pursuing it through the courts. Now, he's claiming he was treated unfavourably. Um, he's British and eligible for the national living wage. Um, clearly, what P&O Ferries have done is dismissed their employees and brought people on who aren't, don't need to meet the national minimum wage. He's also citing the redundancy was a sham, given that his job is still needed, and that there's also no fair selection process either that uh, took place. Now, also, he's put a complaint in to do with harassment regarding how his exit was managed. So he's saying that he was forced to leave his belongings behind when he was unexpected, unexpectedly notified of his dismissal. He said that security staff had carried handcuffs and wore balaclavas to remove staff who refused to leave the ferry. And p &O ferries, he argues, violated, therefore, his dignity and created that intimidating, hostile, degrading and humiliating environment. So, uh, you know, this is all shocking stuff to, to read and hear. Um, and as I said earlier, especially when we know that p &O ferries chose to do what they did, it was intentional, the way they managed the whole uh, change programme. So, um, it would be interesting to see how that tribunal claim progresses and what the outcome of it is. Um, so, we'll certainly be keeping an, an ear out for any news on that. So, of course, if there is any, then we'll obviously uh, share that on our, our website. So, if we think about uh, the learnings from this case, um, it's just a reminder that employees and workers in the UK have the right not to be unfairly or wrongfully dismissed when they have those two years plus service, or not to be automatically dismissed, i.e. that means you don't have to have any qualifying service to bring a claim when it's in connection with things like, you know, TUPI or exercising a statutory right, etc. Um, and there are other uh, examples. There's a legal obligation on employees to carry out meaningful cons consultation with all employees and where there's a certain number of employees being uh, proposed as um, being at risk of redundancy, then there's uh, certain timeframes to um, make sure the consultation uh, is aligned to, and that a legal, um, is a legal requirement to carry out a fair process and to file paperwork with the UK government through the Department of Business and Industry, uh, like I said, which is the HR1 form. So that's a high level summary of um, what we need to be mindful of when uh, learnings from the p and ferries. And I think a few things that I'd say just before we wrap the webinar up and come to your questions, you know, handling redundancy processes or any change programme requires careful handling. 
you know, all line managers should be trained in employment law um, because in terms of how it impacts upon different situations at work, including, you know, how to carry out a consultation process. It's not just about the process, but it's also about, you know, the soft skills that um, is needed to manage those difficult conversations. Planning and preparation is key for any change programme um, and working out crucially, you know, when you plan to make an announcement, work back from when you believe the announcement needs to occur and work back uh, a fair and reasonable time frame from that um, in terms of everything you need to get in place ready so that when you announce your process can roll um, smoothly and make sure that you allow for all the legal time frames within your, your, your planning. And it goes without saying, as with anything to do with managing people, effective communication is vital throughout the process. So, as I said at the start, there is that YouTube video of the CEO announcing um, the dismissals. I mean, it's not, if I was on the receiving end of that, I wouldn't like to be, receive that news in the way that it was delivered, um, both in terms of, um, you know, the unexpected video call, but also uh, the way it was um, communicated in itself. Um, so I think making sure that you follow all these things are critical because it will then help you to avoid those employment tribunal claims. And I've got one final, well actually no, there's a couple more polls, but one to do with a webinar. Um, I'm going to ask the first uh, poll question again. Um, <laughs> and see if there's any differences, but whether you would um, book with <laughs> Pinot Fairies in the future. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, should I close that poll? Yeah. And share the results. So it's about the same as before. It's the same, yes. 88% no, yeah. Oh, 88. I'm quite sure how 88 and 13, but. No, I didn't get that. <laughs> so, you know, um, I guess I wanted to put those polls in because it really is a, um, a point to make for any employer going through change programmes. Yes, you, you need to be mindful of the legislation so that you're not in breach of it. But actually, the publicity that can come from change programmes and how it can um, significantly affect your business, its reputation, you know, especially with the use of social media now, where things are pretty much instant. People take to social media to rant, let off steam. Um, and so I guess this whole PO Ferries case is a um, I guess a reminder as to you know, if you don't treat your employees fairly, appropriately, with respect, then you're going to get backlash, um, you know, and claims as p and are. So, um, thank you for answering that poll. And I believe we're now at uh, the point of taking some questions, if we've had any through. We've had one question. Um, interesting actually for the staff that remain with PO or if they were to rehire the old staff yeah would there be an automatic basis for any further terminations i.e disciplinary or redundancy etc what do you mean then so if i think if if for the staff that are still there because they didn't yeah. make all the staff redundant did they or if they were to rehire some of the previous staff um, would there be an automatic basis for any further terminations? I, if they, I assume if they dismiss them for disciplinary reasons or on the grounds of redundancy, um, any basis of, of unfair dismissal? Yeah. Well, I, suppose, I suppose if they're trying to connect it to this change program back ones. in March, yeah, yeah then uh, it, it's probably quite a hard question to answer without knowing what the context um, situational context yeah but yeah um i guess they would have to show the connection between what's happening now to obviously um how they avoided redundancy back in march 
to try and argue you couldn't get me out back then so now you want me out now and kind now, of thing. Yeah. and that's i think um, that's what they're asking is how do you trust yeah. that the process is fair in the future if based on the history well and that's that's the whole thing isn't it There's well you, you'd precedent. lose all trust wouldn't you yeah absolutely you lose all trust in your employer so even if you know the people remaining and they were taken through a process you would you'd certainly want your union representative representative with you throughout that process but um you, you'd certainly have no trust and confidence in whether they're being completely transparent whether they're being completely honest and open with you know the reasons as to why you're in this process so i, I just think it's I don't know, it just has bad repercussions doesn't it mm. for managing the employment yeah. relationship moving forward going forward yeah absolutely yeah. So another question, um, given that agency workers are cheaper, wouldn't making more expensive workers redundant to avoid an otherwise inevitable bankruptcy make it a genuine reason? So I guess it's looking back at the reasons for... Um, so the reason, I get what the question is saying in terms of there is a genuine reason because of the bankruptcy, a real threat of bankruptcy, and I get that there's a real threat. But I guess the work's not diminished. You say you've, no. got, you've got a genuine business case, first of all, the financial side of it. But mm. how you deal with that business case, that situation that's now presented itself, you know, redundancy or dupe, and it probably, like I touched on earlier, there's that legal debate as to whether the change your operating model to prevent being bankrupt um actually whether that might be the way forward as opposed to making the dismissals yeah i mean and they they didn't carry out a selection process did they so that no. was part of the challenge you know um they could have yeah. selected people fairly hopefully which may have been taking out a layer of management or something um, yeah, but yeah, that that so, isn't the route they chose to do. No, so. and I get I, I do get the question because there's a genuine business issue that needs dealing mm. with. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but doesn't mean mean to say it's a genuine redundancy. No, doesn't equal that. No. So because, another question no. about collective consultation. So if you have to use an employee rep because you're holding collective consultation, mm. how do you decide who they are? Can there be someone at risk of redundancy themselves? And does that employee inform the others of what the plans are to happen? Yes. Yeah, it's so around the collective consultation process. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you vote for, there's an election, isn't there, that mm. you would hold in organising um, reps, which is why coming back to your planning and preparing is so key because you need to allow for these activities in your overall process. So you have to have mm. an election to vote who's going to represent. Um, certain groups in the workforce um, so that you can have that collective consultation and they feed, they then feedback as the employee representative to the rest of the, the employees about what's coming through from the consultations and there's also as well written uh, notes, minutes from those collective consultation minute meetings that obviously can be dis, uh, disclosed and shared, communicated. Yeah, and they, and they can be someone at risk themselves. Yes. They're just representing the body of people who are affected by the re redundancy. Yeah, and um, they they also should um, collect the feedback or the questions from the other people in the group they represent, and yeah. and then um, feed those back to the employer, and then feedback the responses. And quite often, um, you some employers would offer. Um, individual consultation as well um, as collective yeah. for specific individual cases but obviously in this case when there's so many people affected it would have been quite impractical mm. so um, but yeah it's in challenging let's just say yeah. um, uh, a question about can you make a subcontractor redundant or is it just an end of contract so there's a contractor so a co and a subcontractor isn't there so yeah so you yeah. need to be an employee to be um, yeah. eligible for statutory redundancy pay and uh, dismissal um, you can't be um, what's the word a, a contractor third party contractor, no and, yeah. and I think the contractor could make if they employed staff 
but they might just subcontract it out to contractors again. So probably no redundancy for them. You just end the contract. Yeah, um, but what's what's probably interesting is if anybody is dealing with a change program, just sense check before you make any announcement, just sense check that you're satisfied that your contractors who you believe have always been contractors are genuinely are contractors, contractors and yeah. haven't through time and custom practice ended up becoming employees silently. So mm, just absolutely. Sort of sense check that as part of your planning going into any change programme. And hopefully your contractor agreements also make it clear they're not yeah. an employee. Yeah. Um, so um, another question is, did P&O need to inform the DBIS due to the nature of their business or do all companies need to inform that authority? The Department of, yeah, just so there's a, that, yeah, there's a legal requirement under the UK Trade Union Labour Relations Act to notify the government department when there's 100 plus dismissals on redundancy ground. P&O ferries, as I said, there was some legislation a few years ago that meant the obligation to notify the UK Department of Business and Industry transferred to the overseas authority. Um, what wasn't clear is whether the criminal uh, liability transferred across as well. As well. Mm, yeah. But all other employee, employers definitely need to inform. Yes. If you, yeah. yeah. Um, and you can do it online via the HR1 these days, can't you? Mm -hmm. It's um, much easier than posting the, uh, <laughs> the form off I can remember doing in the past. Yeah. Um, there's a question about why are agency workers cheaper? It's a very good question because in my experience they're not, but it's because they negotiated that really low rate, wasn't it, below the national minimum wage, which was part of the yeah. issue. Um, um, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. <laughs> and because so, uh, yeah, it's it's it is part of the um, surprising nature of the whole case is that they managed to negotiate with somebody who's prepared to offer their workers and workers who are prepared to do the work for um, mm. less money than their staff. <laughs> um, mm. So even with the on costs, um, there must be an issue, and I don't know how they get around the but twelve week. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, and I don't know how they got away with the low lower wage when, in well, theory, it's supposed to be the same wage as the people. Well, I think what's happened is they they found a loophole in not having to pay the national minimum wage mm. because this is you know the jurisdiction bit that I talked about. Mm. So they found that loophole, which is hence why the government are trying to then bring in legislation that allows mm. UK ports to refuse entry it, for, of ferries if they're not employing their employees, the UK minimum wage, which I don't know how they can administer that. I, I just I can't get my head around how that would work. No, no. But um, yeah, I think there's that kind of loophole. It is definitely one of the surprising factors in this case. <laughs> yeah. um, and somebody's commented, surely P&O's HR team would have advised against this. Absolutely, I'm sure they will have done. <laughs> Is it likely that senior management ignored the advice and took the route they did? I yeah. think it was probably, um, they probably took legal advice and the lawyers will have said, these are your options, these are your yeah. risks, take Don't a commercial view if you wish. Yeah, and it's, it was just cheaper for them to take the route they did than actually follow the legal route, which some employers do follow a commercial route rather than necessarily yeah. the legally compliant route, um, because it is cheaper for them to do it in the long run, even with the risk of claims. Um, but obviously, if you tidy up in a settlement agreement, then you're limited to what claims you could bring. <laughs> yeah. Um, so as a question around the elections, um, is it the SMT who is in charge of the election of the employee rep? So it it's depends actually, because often mm. the HR department will organise it, um, but somebody needs to take, um, to be responsible for organising the secret ballot and for collecting in all the uh, nominated representatives and then also for voting on the nominated representatives so that um, you get the one with the most votes that mm. are, will represent those staff. So 
um, somebody needs to coordinate that whole process. Yeah. And the coordinator would probably need to be on the management team um, or mm. be the HR um, yeah. manager in that process. Um, and it, did we say we could tupe an employee over to being a contractor in a worst case if you can no longer afford to pay them their wage so that they don't lose their job entirely? <laughs> you wouldn't tupe to a contractor, but no. you. Um, you can sometimes people do make people redundant and then take them back on as a contractor. Um, you have to be a bit careful in those cases, and you also have to have a gap in employment. I mean, legally at least a week, but most lawyers recommend at least two weeks, and it's probably best to be even it's further away because of the link. If you make them redundant, you say there's no longer a requirement for that work. If you bring them back as as a contractor doing the same work that they were doing as an employee then a tribunal might take a dim view on it so it's, it's I think it's not an easy one. <laughs> yeah what, what I was talking about is the fact that they're using a third party their operating model mm. has changed so that they're then relying on a third party so this agency um, to carry out the work on their behalf and so the agency are providing people to do that work. Um, that's kind of where I was coming from. Mm. So yeah, interesting. Mm. <laughs> um, I've been asked to discuss the secret ballot a bit more. So um, this is where you have a group of people who uh, you, where you need to elect representatives from. Um, first of all, you invite them to um, nominate who they'd like to represent them and in the case where you have more than one person nominated to represent the same group of people then you have to have um, a secret secret vote of all the people in that group to say which of the nominated reps they want to take it forward um, so it's and that's that's the challenge it's been challenged through um, covid of trying to organize secret ballots online and digitally. Some people have used um, SurveyMonkey or mm. other survey kind of um, platforms to arrange a vote. Um, and some have um, used um, vet polls on Teams and things like that. You can do some of them anonymous. The problem is they have to be anonymous. Yeah. Um, so that's the challenge with some of the platforms. But yeah, it, it has been interesting. Um, we're trying to do it remotely and then when she counted up the votes the one with the highest votes is the one that's appointed as the um, representative and then they are the ones that are invited to the collective um, consultation mm. um, and so we've been asked if there's going to be a webinar on collective individual consultation see. so yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, a good, good point yeah, because there, we do need there. We are writing our next schedule, aren't we? So um, we'll, we'll bear that request in mind, actually. Um, that'd be a good one. Yeah. So I think it's been a while since we've talked redundancies, isn't it? It is, yes. The webinars. That's a, a, good, a good point. So yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll look at that for you. Um, so if you can no longer pay the employees their wage, yeah. um, and, but you need the job, you need the job done, but you don't have the funds to keep them on at the same rate. I think that's the challenge, isn't it, in redundancy programs mm. and why you look at um, can you do it more efficiently with different resources, uh, with resourcing it differently, either reorganizing, with, yeah. Yeah, reorganizing the work or the shifts or the um, the rotors, you know, whatever you use in this in the context of P&O. <clears throat> Excuse me, each employer will obviously have um different things. Sometimes automation means that they don't need quite as many employees. Mm. But the most common is to reduce the number of employees doing the role yeah. um, and to change the way the, the service is delivered or the work is delivered to um, use less people. So, mm. but you can see why in the case of P&O Ferries, it's, um, you know, all, all the people that were affected, um, they presumably can't carry it out with less yeah. staff. So, <clears throat> I think um, there's an element of, you know, if you're in that position, it's taking time to really examine the workplace in terms of um, 
the jobs, the activities, the people in terms of numbers um, and working out different ways, different models in which to carry out that work. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to stay within the business. It can include, you know, outsourcing and, you know, using third parties, you know, and it's working out what's the most cost effective way moving forward. And then it's making that commercial decision as to what is the best change program for your organization at that time. I mean, they were clearly in a, a difficult position that hadn't yeah. got many options. Um, and it would be interesting to know what the um, what the issues really were. Was it the numbers of staff? Do they need to, you know, do they really need to preserve the numbers of staff um, that they need to actually deliver the service, or could they have looked at that and just reduced yeah. the numbers and selected rather than made the whole workforce and took on a cheaper workforce? Mm. But um, I think they were using the protection of the seafarers. Um, legislation um, here Funny because not many, not many employers could have got away with this, um, ex excluding the, the reputational damage, but could have got away with it legally because they don't have the loopholes of um, yeah. pedo ferries. But um, yeah, it's certainly given us a lot to think about from an HR perspective, hasn't it? And uh, made us revisit our own processes probably. Um, so yeah, it's 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 been an interesting one. <laughs> mm. but, but aside from like the legal way of doing things correctly, you know, it's the soft skills as well as as much as anything. It's how you communicate mm. to your employees, like the the language that you use, the tone that you use, and um, the method of delivering messages. You know, that's equally uh, you know as important because it's how you're treating people. And I always say treat people as how you want to be treated and mm. clearly they'd had no regard to people's feelings or uh, awareness of the impact. Um, it just blew up in their face, didn't it? But mm. there we go. Yeah. And the shock, you know, the, yeah. the fact that when people receive shocking news, you normally put in um, sort of sensitive support to mm. to help them. Um, process it but it, I think it was the shot the way they were marched off the ship was sort of the um, the final straw probably yeah. in that process and what didn't help you know if they'd have had a whole team of counsellors present to talk to staff that would have been shocked at losing their job and the impacts of that mm. um, or to have arranged um, you know support afterwards and have um, not kind of marched them off um, in the way they did, then um, I think that may not that may have helped. <laughs> Certainly yeah. would have helped um, individuals, but there, there appeared to be no concern for the individuals once they no. dismissed them. And I think that's what's particularly hard for everybody to swallow. Yeah. You know, okay, take a commercial decision, but do look after them best you can in the process. <laughs> would have been mm. probably a slightly better approach. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, so I think I think that's all the questions for now okay. on this topic. Um, I think we'll definitely look at conducting a webinar on, on consultation process yeah. and all the ins and outs of that um, in, in a separate um, session. But yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll hand back over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. And thank you for those great questions. Mm. So I'm just going to run a quick poll. And it's around whether um, you feel that we can help your businesses in any way. So if you would like us to follow up with you after today's event, uh, just let us know through the poll which areas you'd like to find out more about. And that could be our, any of our HR services, training, our knowledge base, where you'll find all our templates to do with redundancy, consultation, etc., health and safety, services and training, and, and obviously payroll. So do let us know and then we can follow up with you after. Okay, just let that one. Thank you. A few coming through at the moment. Okay, I think we're there. Lovely, okay. thank you. Back over to you. Thank you. 
and um, I've just mentioned a moment ago the knowledge base so um, some of you will already have access to our knowledge base uh, but for those that you don't then you'll find all our template letters forms guides um, on there to help in manage any HR activity whether it's redundancy disciplinary agreements performance etc etc um, and there's lots of information and guidance to there on um, all our subjects um, so um, there's a link here if you do want to um, explore that and find out a little bit more um, so do um, have a look and then we are running a, a training course on holding difficult conversations. So that's coming up on the 13th of September. It will be online um, from two o'clock through to half five. And as you'll see from the slide, then it's it's basically it's a good training course to help you with any of those difficult conversations, whether they're happening in evidency process, whether they're happening in performance management discussions, you know, what have you, it's going to give you an awareness around um, the impact of attitude, you know, um, what makes them difficult, how to approach difficult, difficult conversations and obviously, you know, helping you with some kind of structure to formulate those conversations. So if you are interested, then uh, do check that out there. Um, I've got a link there where you can visit it on our website and we're also running um, an employment law for line managers training um, so again you'll find details on our website um, and again it applies whether you're um, for any aspect of um, you know people uh, management of people whether you know from a redundancy point of view again disciplinary grievance um, all the things you need um, to allow you to carry out your role as a line manager um, legally uh, and, and safely did I go too far on that slide no right sorry about that so we do have other training courses as you can see here um, so do let us know um, if you'd like to come along to any of them we are looking at some new dates as well and just to let you know that some of our training courses do count towards your continuing professional development so that's really good news there and then on the next slide we have some health and safety training courses as well so uh, whether it's safeguarding fire safety mental health you know we've got a large um, selection of training courses there they tend to be face to face in person um, courses obviously for obvious reasons because it's very practical based um, but do check out those training dates that we've got so you can go to our website webinars as you know we offer our free webinars monthly we've we're running a joint one with Norden's accountants about boosting your business finances that's later this month and then our hot topic and um, really next month is all about immigration and the latest developments because we've seen quite a few over the last few months and in August we're going to be focusing on trans equality in the workplace um, so do check those out and as I said a moment ago we are looking to write the next webinar program so if you do have any ideas um, such as consultations um, that somebody's submitted then obviously do let us know because we'll use that to formulate our webinar program moving forward we also have some free health and safety webinars as well so we've got some interesting ones coming up around prosecutions and directors responsibilities so there there'll be good ones to come along to and then we've got fire safety and safeguarding as well later on at the end of the summer we're running a seminar in September as well. This will be with Norden's accountants. It's a seven key successes seminar. Um, so do have a look into that. See if it's something that can help you and your business. Um, so that'd be quite interesting. So do uh, check that out. And that does conclude our webinar for today. So as usual, if you do have any questions, please do contact us at the information that's showing on your screen, especially if you've got any ideas for webinar um, suggestions. Um, we also do like your feedback. So um, there will be a um, quick survey sent out immediately after the webinar that we would really appreciate you participating in. And this just really brings me to say thank you everybody for joining and coming along today. We have slightly overrun, but I think we've had some great questions and I hope you found it of interest. 
um, and thank you Sue and um, Rebecca for supporting in the webinar and um, we look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you everybody.